again, it just tells the story of it's the evil and the um, the ugliness of people's hearts these days is everywhere. guys welcome to the think tank so for those of you that did not see the motions on the well they're calling it significant relationships in the karen reed case you might want to see this one um they are mentioning some of the stuff that has come back from the fbi and i tell you what <clears throat> i'm finding a very interesting exactly what they're saying but you know what we won't find out the rest for a little bit longer so tell me what you guys think down below of this judge all right so let's check this out when we were last here on february 26th uh, I first anticipated that today would be for all motions, but I did read the very detailed affidavit from defense counsel regarding dates and what we should cover. And so today, I, as you know, I changed some of the dates to accommodate you, uh, to accommodate, I think there was a, some short trial dates you may have had or restitution dates. And so you did get the order on the new dates. Watch what happens here when she gives out the time frames of each lawyer's um, addressing the court. Um, so today is only for filing all Rule 17 motions and for the motion to dismiss under Odell and the motion for sanctions. So I don't remember if it was Mr. Jackson or Mr. Yanetti who last time said that I was operating from a blind spot because I didn't have the information that was disclosed to you folks um, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. So you were good enough to get me the entire packet, which I appreciate. Uh, I read it. Um, I see now how the federal investigation began and when it began. I've also read the pleading. So the motion to dismiss... Defendant's motion to dismiss is around 50 pages with attachments. The supplement is about 15 pages. The Commonwealth's opposition is about the same. The motion for sanctions is about 30 pages. There's no supplement, Mr. Yanetti? There's no supplement. Okay, and then the Commonwealth had about 25 pages, and then the Commonwealth supplement covered both motions, and the Commonwealth had originally probably hundreds of pages of exhibits. So I have read all of that, and I am mindful also, I keep coming back to the letter that was written for me, to me on February 26 from the Deputy U.S. Attorney, who says, we expect, of course, that the parties will disclose orally the materials in court only as necessary to further the proceedings. So I've read everything. Um, I'm going to give each side 10 minutes, and we're going to start with the motion to dismiss. Um, so, Mr. Jackson, I'll hear you. I think it would be particularly helpful if you were to focus on the exact prejudice to the defendant and how this all goes to the core of the Odell motion. And as you know, that's an awfully high bar. So... Go ahead. Your Honor, I, I will try to edit um, my comments to stay within t the 10 minute mark. It's very difficult to do that. I did not know that we were gonna be under such incredible time constraints. As a matter of fact, I thought that the court said the last time we were in court, we had basically your, your words. Yeah, that we all had day, all day. But that was when we had all the motions, but it's just these two motions right, today. But they're, but they're big. 
uh, You're big. Consist, uh, uh, so consistent with why don't you go ahead and start? If you need additional time, tell me. But it would be important to focus your argument. Again, I'm mindful of what the U.S. attorney said to me in that letter. And, and I am as well. And my that mindfulness suggests that my comments will be directed to that which is necessary to further the proceedings. Okay. Which means that right ahead. I'll start with the, um, uh, the basic rule of Odell. Uh, we start with the postulate that any distortion of the evidence, that's where we start, any distortion of the evidence during the course of a grand jury proceeding impairs the integrity of- He is not a happy camper. <laughs> I don't blame him 10 minutes, guys, 10 minutes. The indictment, if there is an indictment and pursue it to Odell, that requires dismissal. Um, in this particular case, there were myriad examples, which I will, again, I'll edit. I was going to go through several, but I'll just touch on them very quickly. Your memo, I have to say, your memo is very thorough and very helpful to me because you outline everything and same in your supplement. Thank you. Um, the first point I want to discuss is the, what we believe is the failure to disclose Sergeant Michael Lenk's personal lifelong relationship with some of the individuals, specifically the individual, Chris Albert. There was a, a comment or a, a, an incident, I should say, that we referred to in our moving papers that dealt with Chris Albert and Sergeant Lank years ago. They have a longstanding, years-long relationship. And I'll, I'll, I'll close this loop in just a second, but if you'll allow me, that relationship goes all the way back to 2002 at least. And there was an incident in which Sergeant Lank and Chris Albert had gotten into what can easily be described as a bar fight. Chris Albert had gotten into a bar fight of some sort. Michael Lank walks out of the, the same bar or an adjacent bar. He had been drinking with his buddy Chris. He walks out, stumbles out, announces to the, to the uh, participants in this fight that he was quote unquote deputizing himself and ultimately came to Chris Albert's aid. That was with the specific intent to assist an Albert in getting out of a legal jam all the way back to 2002. The reason I bring that up, and by the way, both of the individuals involved, not Sergeant Lank, both of the other individuals involved were ultimately arrested by Sergeant Lank. That case went to trial and both of the individuals were found not guilty of assault. And that's after Michael Lank engaged in fisticuffs with at least one of the men to the degree that the Canton police officers had to pull him off of the individual. So this is, this is in your memo and it also is exhibits C through E attached That's right. to your memo. And the reason this comes to a head and the, the, the conflict of interest comes to a head is because Michael Lank ultimately was the first person to walk into Brian Albert's house. During the course of the grand jury, nobody elicited information from Michael Lank that he had a close personal relationship with the Alberts, that he had in years past come to the Alberts aid. And yet he was the first person that came into the house. Even the grand jurors were stunned by this and asked the specific grand jurors, asked Michael Lank and asked the Commonwealth or through the Commonwealth of the witness, why didn't Brian Albert ever even come out of the house? And I think we have the answer. And the answer is because the Albert, specifically Brian Albert, was waiting on a friendly. And they got that friendly through Michael Lank. That was withheld from the grand jury. Sergeant Lank is a longtime childhood friend of the Alberts. The Canton Police Department was conflicted off the case because of those personal and familiar relationships that the Alberts have with Canton Police Department. And Sergeant Lank has a history of using his position as a police officer to shield the Alberts from criminal liability. That was never brought out. That's the kind of distortion that Odell talks about. Another broad example or a broad category that I want to discuss briefly deals with Trooper Michael Proctor. The Commonwealth held, withheld from the grand jury clear and even more egregious <clears throat> conflicts of interest as they pertain to Michael Proctor. Sergeant Lank was aware of this irremediable conflict that Canton Police Department had and that he should have had with the Alberts. So what does he do? He calls in Massachusetts State Police and who do they send but Michael Proctor? And that's like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. That's the same Michael Proctor who's also years long, close family friends with the Alberts. The Proctors have called the Alberts their quote, second family. And to that point, now we have benefit of some hindsight and that's the federal investigation. We've been saying since September 16th, 2022, 
in lengthy motions that we filed before this court and filed with the Commonwealth. There is a conflict. You're not investigating the conflict. That conflict was never described to the grand jurors. And we've been rebuffed at every single turn. Newly uncovered text messages but from the feds revealed that on January 19th, 2022, think about that date, that's 10 days before the incident. January 19th, 2022, Michael Proctor texted his own family members discussing the specifics of having Julie Albert babysit for his toddler child. We should all let that sink in for a second. So yeah, I understand that. There is a level of closeness that cannot be overstated. Michael Proctor is so connected to the Alberts that he was entrusting them or willing to entrust the Alberts to be caregivers for his toddler child. And it's not lost on anybody in this courtroom that for two years, the Commonwealth has been denying it and still denies it in their opposition paperwork. They still say, well, there's nothing to see here. It's Michael Proctor's sister who really is friends with Julie Albert and that, you know, that's not a big deal. Everybody looked the other way. As a matter of fact, Ms. McLaughlin wrote the following in her opposition. Trooper Proctor's supposed close and personal relationship with the Alberts is, quote, entirely unfounded and a desperate creation of the defense, a desperate creation of ours. We, she says we created this. But now we have the benefit of the federal investigation. And the Commonwealth finds itself in that very unenviable position of having to eat some very distasteful words because we didn't create anything. And there's more. On February 1st, 2022, three days after John O'Keefe was killed, there was another text message. In this one, Michael Proctor's sister texts Michael Proctor very specifically and writes the following, quote, just saw Julie, and Julie said when all this is over, she wants to give you, Michael Proctor, a thank you gift. Michael Proctor didn't respond with, that's inappropriate, these are witnesses, these are potential suspects, uh, please tell her don't ever do that again, don't ever suggest an exchange of gifts again, that would be inappropriate, I'm gonna go write a report, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Lally, and Mr. Lally's gonna turn that information over to the defense and to the court, no. That's what he should have done. What he did do is he responded, get Elizabeth one, his wife. In other words, get the gift from my wife, it'll be a little less obvious. So now we have the lead investigator from Massachusetts State Police literally discussing the exchange of gifts between the Albert family on the one hand and the Proctor family on the other hand as a thank you, their words, for helping the Alberts out of a jam. And if you looked up quid pro quo in the dictionary, you would find this set of text messages. Two years later to the day on February 1st, 2024. Now let's fast forward two years later. Now Michael Proctor finds himself on the witness stand in front of a federal grand jury, which we just found out about. That grand jury was tasked with a singular commission and that was investigating crimes of public corruption by law. So what do you think 10 minutes to get through what he's got to get through? Is that okay? I mean, look at what's coming out and he's being asked to minimize it. A lot of people are saying that this judge just is involved with the Alberts and I don't know. They call her auntie. The other side calls her auntie. Law enforcement in relation to this case. And during that testimony, he was confronted with these and, and myriad other examples of evidence of his close ties to the Albert family. And he admitted to an AUSA under very intense questioning that not only does he know the Alberts and does he socialize with them, does he drink with them, does he go to pool parties with them? So I'll just say allegedly. <laughs> but he told his partner, Yuri Buknik, all of this before Yuri Buknik testified at the grand jury and before he and Buknik actually interviewed Chris Albert. Why does that mean something? Why does that mean something to the court and to this argument? Because when Yuri Buknik testified before the state court grand jury, he testified that, quote, following formal introductions, end quote, Julie Albert and Chris Albert provided their phone numbers following formal introductions. That was a clear deceit 
on the grand jurors. Yuri Buknik knew, as did Michael Proctor, they didn't need formal introductions. Michael Proctor was considering having Julie Albert babysit his kid 10 days ago, actually at that time, 13 days ago. That left the grand jury with the intentional false in, uh, impression that these people literally do not know each other. They've never been in contact. They're complete strangers. That was a lie. That was a concerted effort to hide that relationship and to hide the conflict of interest. And the grand jurors were fooled. They were left with the impression, Michael Prochner, Yuri Butnik, they don't know these folks. They're completely neutral, independent investigators, and nothing could be further from the truth. And the revelation of this evidence culminated in front of that same grand jury on February 1st, 2024, under additional intense questioning by the assistant United States attorney, Proctor was caught in his own web of deceit and testified as follows, quote, so uh, this is the AUSA talking or asking the question. So obviously we're asking questions about your relationship with Julie Albert, with Chris Albert and with Colin Albert. Do you understand that? Answer, yes, sir. Question, and you're saying that you're minimizing, quote, minimizing your relationship to the grand jury, correct? Answer. Yes, he finally, under the scrutiny of a federal grand jury, admitted that he had been lying about his relationship to the Alberts, which means he lied to the grand jury, which means the evidence was distorted in front of the grand jury. And okay. that is the burden that Odell requires. All right, so your time is up, which includes me interjecting. Do you want five more minutes? If I could, if I could yeah. employ the court. I'd, I'd like you to sort of get to the questions I asked as well. All right, I know you're reciting the evidence um, that I've read, but so I'll, I'll give you five more minutes. Go Thank ahead. you. I want to shift gears to a, uh, another example or another series of examples of evidence that was distorted before the grand jury. Um, and that deals with the use of or the, the um, insinuation of Kevin Albert, yet another Albert, at the behest of Michael Proctor. Kevin Albert is a sworn Canton police officer. On day one, the Canton Police Department was completely recused off the case in no small part because of Kevin Albert and the fact that uh, uh, John O'Keefe's body was found on Kevin Albert's brother's lawn. Yet the evidence that has been disclosed by the federal investigation, which we, had no we were not privy to, um, is that Michael Proctor actually utilized Kevin Albert's services to coordinate with the very witnesses who should have been potentially suspects and certainly should not have been subject to coordination by an Albert. When that's the very person on whose lawn uh, John O'Keefe or his brother's lawn, John O'Keefe was found. I wanna to turn to at least one more, in, uh, one more situation okay. uh, in my remaining minute or so, uh, given the fact that this is curtailed. And this is not in our, our papers, but obviously it's a complete and probably the most obvious distortion of the facts. The Commonwealth suppressed one of the most obvious pieces of exculpatory evidence in the entire case, and that was a piece of evidence that they know torpedoes their entire case and their theory of this case. And that's Jennifer McCabe's Google search at 2.27 a.m., how long to die in cold. They had the, her phone at the time of the grand jury. They had her complete extraction of that phone at the time of the grand jury. They had a Celebrite report, Your Honor, at the time of the grand jury, and yet they did not present this evidence. They claim, oh, well, we didn't have the right version of the Celebrite uh, software. That's on them. That's not our fault, certainly not Ms. Reed's fault. That's their fault. Get the right software. If you're gonna bring this case, do it the right way. They say their, their argument is, well, we just didn't have the right software, so we didn't have the information. That's not true. They did have the information. It was sitting in her phone. They just didn't do their job and extract it. And should the Commonwealth once again stand up in some sort of def desperate pitch to dispute that time and this critical evidence, the court should note the following. Not only does the Celebrite report confirm the search and the time of that search, not only do our experts confirm the search and the time of that search, but now, a Quantico-trained special agent with the FBI's Regional Computer Forensic Lab. In other words, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation also specifically confirms that that search was made on Jennifer McCabe's phone and it was made on or before 2.27 and 40 seconds a.m. on January 29th, 
2022. That fact, Your Honor, is no longer open for debate. And none of that was presented before the grand jury. I'll conclude by saying any one of these examples, and I didn't touch on all of them, but any one of these examples, the gift giving, uh, the babysitting, uh, the, the telephone extraction, the Google search at 227 in the morning, all of these, any one of these would be enough to dismiss the charges as they sit here today. But the cumulative effect of this deception and all of it, this distortion from the grand jury is too much for the court to ignore. The simple fact, Your Honor, is the presentation before the, uh, by the Commonwealth before the grand jury and the state court action, it just wasn't fair. That's the easiest way to say it. It just didn't give Ms. Reed a fair shot. It just didn't. That presentation was, pa was packed with lies, known lies by the investigators, and the omissions and the manipulations and deceit by the very people that are supposed to be the ones that we in the community can trust. The ones that we're, are supposed to protect our interests and the law does not allow this sort of conduct to go unchecked. When the, the remedy, when this sort of travesty of justice occurs is established by the, this state's Supreme Judicial Court and that is dismissal of the indictment in its entirety. And it is not enough. And I'll be surprised if I don't hear it today but something suggests, based on the, the moving papers that we just got from Ms. McLaughlin and Mr. Mc, uh, Mr. Lally, are, well, Your Honor, we, we didn't know. We didn't know about the text messages. We didn't know about Proctor. We didn't know about Lank. All that stuff was revealed through the federal grand jury. It doesn't matter that Ms. McLaughlin individually didn't know, or Mr. Lally can say, I, I claim ignorance. I didn't know either. It's enough that, the, that an arm of their institution, law enforcement, they knew, and that was their job to tell the truth. That was their job not to fool or distort the Commonwealth. I'm sorry, the, uh, the grand jurors. And with that, Your Honor, thank you for the time and I'll submit. All right, thank you. Mr. Lally, we're gonna start with 10 minutes. If you need more, you need to tell me. So I don't know, she just, okay, if you need it. I don't know what to think, you guys, like what? I, I I don't know if she's got any kind of reason as the defense is saying to behaving to be behaving this way, but I find it absolutely disgusting. Uh, when I see somebody with titles like this where I feel like they're possibly leaning, to one side or the other. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that she's innocent because I don't know, but I just really like to feel like everybody is doing what they should be doing. Let me know down below what you guys think. Am I totally wrong? I mean, maybe this is normal and I just don't realize it. Sure. <laughs> And thank you, Your Honor. No, I, I think 10 minutes should be fine. I just, uh, I know the court has uh, taken uh, painstaking uh, detail to go through all the, the material that's submitted, so I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, essentially, the defendant, as, as the court is aware, <clears throat> doesn't challenge uh, the grand jury presentation on the McCarthy grounds or probable cause standard. Defendant motions challenges under Odell. Uh, Odell essentially states dismissal of an indictment on impairment of the grand jury proceedings requires proof of three elements, as the court is well aware. Uh, one, that the Commonwealth knowingly or recklessly presented false or deceptive evidence to the grand jury. Uh, secondly, that the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. And three, that the evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. None of which uh, I would submit uh, the defendant has uh, met their burden uh, with reference to any of those three elements. Just addressing uh, sort of the overarching uh, themes of, of the defendant's motion. Uh, the defendant challenges, uh, as he just stated, the testimony of uh, Canton Police Sergeant Lank and his testimony attributing statements to the defendant that were made in the aftermath of Mr. O'Keefe's body being discovered in a purported deception of Sergeant Lank's uh, relationship with the Albert family. Uh, Trooper Proctor's uh, purported false and deceptive statements uh, throughout the course of his testimony and the Commonwealth's failure to uh, elicit a purported inconsistent statement of Christopher Albert and the Commonwealth's failure to impeach uh, Julie Albert's testimony. Your Honor, simply put, none of these uh, 
issues or, or stated malfeasance uh, actually uh, occurred before this grand jury. As it relates uh, to uh, Sergeant Lank, I mean, we're talking about uh, what, what the defendant submits as an attachment is an incident from uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, which doesn't involve anyone who was at the house at uh, 34 Fairview Road on the night uh, when Mr. O'Keefe died. Um, the statements that uh, Sergeant Lank uh, is attributing to the defendant were not only testified to uh, by Sergeant Lank, as, and they're testified not in a deceptive manner, they're testified to by Sergeant Lank in the sense that he indicated he spoke to officers who had preceded his arrival. All of those officers also testified before the grand jury. Um, all of those members who uh, received statements from the defendant uh, is essentially indicating that she did it. That doesn't just come from one source. That comes from at least five different witnesses, three of them paramedics with the Canton Fire Department. Counsel posits the question of why didn't Brian Alba come out of the house? No one did, not only out of that house, but any house. It's clearly visible in the grand jury exhibits. You have the cruiser camera footage from Officer Seraf, uh, as far as no one else in the neighborhood coming out of the house, as well as testimony from a number of different witnesses uh, that were there and present on that morning in the dark, in a blizzard at the time that Mr. O'Keefe is found. Counsel wants to say that the Commonwealth is asking the court or everybody to sort of look the other way when it comes to these things. What I would submit is that's exactly what the defendant is doing. Look the other way, defense by obfuscation. It's essentially, it's a, it's a three card money trick, uh, you know, car trick uh, on the corner on the side. Look at all of this, look at uh, this relationship, look at that relationship, conflating these relationships, sort of the distortion that I would say between what exists in social media realm and what exists in reality. That if you know someone, that automatically means that you're best friends with them, every single one of their siblings, every single person that they've ever met or socialized with. Uh, one social interaction, you know, transforms into a long-standing 20-year relationship, all of those things. And what the defense is obfuscating from is the overwhelming evidence that was presented to this grand jury from a multitude of sources, 42 separate witnesses, 56 exhibits, over 1,400 pages of transcript, which clearly demonstrate and indicate that the defendant, Karen Reed, killed John O'Keefe. But they don't want you to look at that. They want you to look at who texted who when and what they said and what was asked and what was promised. The, in reviewing the materials uh, provided by the U.S. Attorney's Office, a couple things that I would note is, number one, um, they have no idea how much of a percentage of the totality of the federal materials we have. I don't know if we have 5%, 50%, 90%. I have no idea. The other part that's confounding is that it appears that these uh, materials or materials from the state prosecution were provided to the U.S. Attorney's Office by Mr. Yanetti or by the defendant or by defense counsel. And again, what I don't know is how much of a percentage of the total discovery from the state case was actually given and provided uh, to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in which to conduct their investigation. But it's clear from the investigation that they extensively investigated the facts and circumstances that led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. In sum, what I would submit, just as Ms. McLaughlin stated on the last date, that these materials are largely consistent with the Commonwealth theory of the case. There is no suggestion of a third-party culprit, no suggestion of cover-up of evidence, no suggestion uh, from the 13 civilians uh, witnesses' testimony that we've received, uh, or transcripts of that testimony, all of them confirmed that Mr. O'Keefe never entered 34 Fairview Road. All of it uh, was absolutely no animosity between the individuals at the Waterfall Bar or at 34 Fairview residence. There was no fight, there was no dog attack, there was no eyewitness to the circumstances that led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. Witnesses also testified consistent a year later. They testified in the state grand jury in the spring of 2022, largely in the spring of 2022, and then largely in the spring of 2023 before the federal grand jury. And their testimonies are largely consistent with the defendants uh, making declarative statements that she did it, uh, not a question mark.
a year later, they testified in the state grand jury in the spring of 2022, largely in the spring of 2022, and then largely in the spring of 2023 before the federal grand jury. And their testimonies are largely consistent with the defendants uh, making declarative statements that she did it, uh, not a question mark at the end, but clear uh, definitive statements on scene that she had discussed uh, the damage to her taillight prior to leaving Mr. O'Keefe's home on the morning of January 29th. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Let me get back here. So, yeah, the marks on the car. And let's get back into this. You have a number of different uh, statements that were alluded to uh, by Mr. Jackson in regard to uh, text between uh, tr from Trooper Proctor's phone. Of note, there are no text messages between Trooper Proctor's phone and Julie Albert's phone, except for two no content text messages, one from June 21st, 2020, and one from September 1st of 2020. There is a discussion between Trooper Proctor and his sister because Julie Albert had uh, provided childcare in a pinch uh, on several occasions for Trooper Proctor's sister. Trooper Proctor also testified that Julie Albert never did that for him, never watched his kids, never uh, had looked after his children. Uh, that essentially never happened. <laughs> Lastly, <clears throat> get to the, uh, the Google search. And I would agree with counsel in the sense that it's really no longer open for debate. But I'm not really sure why we're still even talking about this or why this is still a topic uh, that they're pushing. Essentially, what we have is, <clears throat> yes, what counsel mentions is there is one expert who was given two extractions, presumably provided by defense counsel, uh, that indicates uh, from that particular FBI expert uh, that the searches were done at two something in the morning. What counsel neglects to sort of raise and, and stress with the court is that there's a separate, uh, and I forget exactly what it stands for, but an RCFL uh, uh, analysis of the phone in which through both Axiom and through Celebrite, uh, and that conclusion of that expert is that the searches occurred when Ms. McCabe testified they occurred because the defendant asked her to conduct those searches at 623 and 624 in the morning. Really, the argument stops at the point of it's not, we didn't do our job to get a cell. The cell bright version that shows that information did not exist at the time of the grand jury. So I'm, I'm not really sure how the Commonwealth is supposed to run something through a cell bright version that isn't in existence at the time the grand jury is conducted. It's a subsequent version in which their expert, Mr. Green, finds these uh, purported uh, search without looking at the cache files, without looking at the DB list, without looking at the SQLite database, without looking at the wall file, all of which was done not only by Trooper Garino, an independent expert named Jessica Hyde, which counsel has all of those, as well as the senior technical uh, uh, analyst from cell by itself, a man named Mr. Whiffen. Counsel's had this report for months at this point. And essentially, Mr. Whiffen, uh, <clears throat> is essentially the person who creates the software that all of these experts are using. And his definitive opinion indicated in his report is that Ms. McCabe conducted those searches at 623 and 624 in the morning. So I would agree with counsel uh, that it's really no longer up for debate. Uh, I think we just disagree as to uh, the conclusions of that. But based on the totality of the evidence uh, and what I would submit as the overwhelming evidence that was presented uh, to this grand jury, uh, all of these sort of individual uh, parsing of, of stated malfeasance simply doesn't even come close uh, to sustaining the burden under Odell. And for that reason, I would ask that the court deny the motion to dismiss. Okay. Do you want a few minutes, Mr. Jackson, to respond? Very briefly. Okay. Um, first of all, it, it's always interesting to hear an argument that suggests there's there's nothing to see here. That's exactly what Mr. Lally did yet again. He said, look the other way, look the other way. Oh, it's the defense that wants you to look the other way. <laughs> we don't want you to look the other way, Your Honor. We want you to look directly at the evidence of the compromised relationships that Trooper Proctor had and hid. That's what we want the court to look at. He suggests, oh, well, there's just a couple of text messages. It's no big deal. It's couple... the, the fact is, Your Honor, uh, she really hit him. She really hit him with the car. Let's remember, she really hit him. And these text messages, they mean nothing. We're talking about the integrity 
of a, of a, a, a sitting grand jury and the presentation before that grand jury. What Mr. Lally now has in his possession, but he didn't mention, now that he says, oh, well, she, she killed him. Let's just get on with it. She killed him. He's already tried and convicted her in his mind and tried to do it in this courtroom. It doesn't quite work that way. Now Mr. Lally has in his possession another thing from the feds that we didn't have access to. The federal investigators hired, independent of us, we had no idea, and independent of the Commonwealth, hired a professional reconstructionist, three PhDs, to look into exactly this, this issue. Did Karen Reed's car, did her SUV make contact with John O'Keefe? And their conclusion to a person was, his injuries were inconsistent with the damage on the car, the, in, the damage on the car was inconsistent with having, been made, having made contact with John O'Keefe's body. In other words, the car didn't hit him, and he wasn't hit by the car, period, full stop. That's their independent expert, not ours, not somebody on our payroll, like Mr. Whiffen, or one of their experts, or Trooper Garino, who's an arm of the agency. This is an independent federal government witness, or series of witnesses, who say unequivocally, that car did not hit John O'Keefe, and John O'Keefe was not hit by that car. But he didn't mention that. Second, he argued that the, the texts were not, you know, these aren't texts between Julie Proctor, I'm sorry, Julie Albert and Michael Proctor. These are texts between his family members. And then, then he mentions these two texts that had no content. What are the chances that Michael Proctor sent Julie Albert texts with no content. Your Honor, it's not that they didn't have content, it's that it couldn't be recovered, which sometimes happens. But we do have evidence that they were in fact in communication with each other as early as 2020. And with regard to the 2.27 a.m. search, um, it's not a three card Monty. It's not a shell game or whatever other fanciful thing Mr. Lally wants to suggest that it is as he tap dances his way around this. He says that our expert, Rick Green, didn't look at the SQ Light database. Yeah, Mr. Lally, reread re his report. Yes, he did. He didn't look at the wall file. Yeah, Mr. Lally, reread his report. Yes, he in fact did. And he's the one that found the 2.27 a.m. search. And with regard to the regional computer forensics lab, that's the definition he couldn't remember, what they actually said was, because Mr. Lally got this wrong too, what they actually said was yes, there was a 623 and a 624 search, and there was a 227 AM search as well. All three of those searches existed in the phone, Julie McCabe's, uh, Jennifer McCabe's phone, and it's not up for debate. That wasn't presented to the grand jury. The information that we've been talking about today wasn't presented to the grand jury. We're talking about the integrity of a proceeding. He doesn't get to convict my client by standing up here and pounding the fist, uh, pounding the table and saying, oh, she did it, she hit him. So let's just all get on with it and deny this motion. We're talking about the integrity of what is the foundation of Massachusetts judicial system. And that integrity was comp uh, compromised, that integrity was impaired. And it demands that justice be done. And that justice is in the hands of this court. We ask this court to do what the, the evidence dictates do what the law dictates, and that is dismiss this indictment. That is the only way justice will be found in this case. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Yannetti, are you all set? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. So the, the, the same time, and uh, let's see how you do with it. We believe our witnesses, they are telling the truth. Karen Reed is guilty. Any suggestion to the contrary is a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Can you imagine a district attorney with a sworn duty to do justice and respect the presumption of innocence issuing such a statement in a pending case? Before August 25th of 2023, I could not Yet that was the message of Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey to potential jurors in this case on that date. 
I've been practicing criminal law as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney for over 30 years now. Never have I seen such unethical conduct from a prosecutor. I know of at least one law professor who used Mr. Morrissey's statement in his class to teach his law students how a prosecutor should not act. Another member of the bar has already reported Mr. Morrissey's conduct to the BBO. And now we are here with a motion to disqualify Mr. Morrissey from further prosecuting this case because he has a personal interest in the outcome. Your Honor, this court should grant our motion to disqualify. And at the outset, I note that we've also moved for sanctions, dismissal of these indictments as a result of his misconduct. But we have so many additional grounds for dismissal as a result of the material provided to both sides by the federal authorities that we will be filing a further motion to dismiss for extraordinary governmental misconduct. My co-counsel has spoken to that previously. To the extent that the court entertains our motion for sanctions, specifically dismissal as a result of his so agreement. Can, can I just interrupt there and ask you, are these going to be the same motion essentially? No, uh, there's uh, information and evidence that's been provided by the federal authorities, which deals with the egregious conduct of both the district attorney and his investigators and the police that will be the subject of a uh, separate motion, Your Honor. So I thought that was going to be your supplemental memo to this motion. It sounds like it's the same issue, Mr. No, Manning. it's it's not. And I'm uh, what I'm uh, saying to the court is I want I have limited time. I, want, I, I when I interrupt you, I, I stop the time. Well, I, so. I appreciate that. But even even with that, Your Honor, my the focus of my argument is going to be is going to be on the disqualification as opposed. You know, guys. I don't know. Please let me know what you think below because am I seeing a bias or am I not? Like, I don't know. I don't know. To the dismissal. I've submitted papers on the dismissal. I will rest on those papers with regard to that issue. That's my only point. All um, right. So when you file the other motion, I need you to include in your memo how that's different specifically from understood. this. Not just the remedy but how the basis Understood. of it is different. Understood. All right, so I'm going to start you again from scratch. Go right ahead. I appreciate it. Well, Your Honor, this case uh, admittedly has been an unusual one for a district attorney to deal with. The district attorney's office is not accustomed to a criminal defendant fighting back in the way we have prior to trial. What usually happens when the prosecution brings charges is they detail the allegations at an arraignment in court, and as a result of their narrative, as a result, their narrative and theory of the case becomes widely reported, while the defendant and the defense team remain relatively quiet. After arraignment, moreover, the media typically lose interest and wait until a trial or potential resolution of the case before they start reporting on the case again. And in this way, the district attorney's office is quite accustomed to always controlling the narrative in pending cases, at least until the defense makes an opening statement at trial. And as long as the prosecution gets to control the narrative in the press, they have no problem with what's being reported. But of course, this case has been different. Their control of the narrative did not last very long here. In our view, it became clear very early on in this case that their narrative was wrong. Their theory of the case was wrong. Their allegations did not fit with the evidence that we fought so hard and for so long to get access to over two long years. So along the way, we spoke out about our findings of exculpatory evidence, mostly within this courtroom, but occasionally outside. The DA was not used to that and apparently didn't like it because they initially sought the extraordinary remedy from this court of trying to gag the defense from exercising our First Amendment rights to discuss a client who at all times is presumed to be innocent. And as you know, they filed that motion on June 9th of 2023, and it didn't work. The court denied the motion, specifically ruling that any statements attributed to counsel could generally be characterized as responses to the accusations against Ms. Reed and are therefore permitted under the rules. When you made that ruling though, Your Honor, you admonished both sides that commenting on the credibility of witnesses would have a prejudicial effect on the proceeding. And at that point, we largely stopped making extrajudicial statements. By contrast, Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey, only 25 days after that court's ruling, 
instead decided, decided to blatantly ignore this court's admonishment. DA Morrissey went off the rails, gave an unprecedented video statement to the media where he specifically vouched for the credibility of Commonwealth witnesses in violation of the rules of professional responsibility, in violation of this court's order. A member of the public issued a public records request, and we got this to show all of the media outlets that DA Morrissey made sure received his statement. Before any trial has occurred, he called the defense theory in this case, quote, a false narrative. Before any trial has occurred, he announced his opinion that nobody within the home at 34 Fairview participated in any murder or any cover up. Before any trial, he vouched for the credibility of Commonwealth witnesses, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and Brian Albert. He announced that those witnesses were forthcoming. In other words, truthful. Before any trial has occurred, DA Morrissey announced that the defense theory is, quote, a desperate attempt to reassign guilt, end quote. Given those broad statements of Mr. Morrissey's opinion that Karen Reed is guilty, can you believe that the DA in their opposition to this motion had the audacity to claim that DA Morrissey's words were narrowly tailored to the harassment of witnesses? It goes without saying, but your words are not narrowly tailored if you're a prosecutor vouching for the credibility of witnesses, particularly after a judge told you not to do that. Your words are not narrowly tailored if you're announcing to the public that you've already assigned guilt to a criminal defendant before trial, a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. DA Morrissey announced every potential juror in Norfolk County, not that someone charged with a crime is innocent until proven guilty. The words innocent until proven guilty never came out of his mouth. Instead, he announced his office had already assigned guilt to Karen Reed. So in his view, when she fought back by re reasserting her right to be presumed innocent, he deemed that a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Never in over 30 years of practice have I ever witnessed an elected DA so blatantly violate the rules of professional responsibility. Never have I witnessed an elected DA trample on the constitutional rights of a criminal defendant who enjoys the presumption of innocence. And I do have some perspective in this area. I had the privilege of spending the first 10 years of my career as an assistant district attorney in Middlesex County. I had the privilege of working with and for some of the finest DAs this Commonwealth has ever seen. From Scott Harshbarger to my mentor, Tom Riley, to Martha Coakley, Jerry Leone, Marion Ryan. In addition, I worked with some of the finest Massachusetts state troopers acting as homicide investigators. Men and women I respect for their integrity and prowess as ethical investigators. In a million years, I could not imagine any of my former colleagues and bosses making such a statement. They were professionals with ethics and a humble respect for the awesome power they possessed as public prosecutors. So for those reasons, in some ways, it, it pains me to have to file a motion like this. But DA Morrissey, through his poor and unethical decision-making, to release a video statement designed to prejudice potential jurors against my client has forced my hand. So the question then becomes, why did he do this? Why did he take such a personal interest in this case such that he would take the unprecedented, and that's his word, unprecedented, step of vouching for Commonwealth witnesses? Why would he take the unprecedented step of denigrating the defense theory to potential jurors? The unprecedented step of announcing to the public that Karen Reed is guilty. Why would he trample over the presumption of innocence and announce that we're trying to reassign the guilt that he's already assigned to her? Well, on December 4th of 2023, we began to learn why. That was when the DA released uh, to us correspondence he had had with the U.S. Attorney's Office, which dated back to May of 2023. That correspondence revealed that federal authorities were investigating this case. And it's worth noting they only released those to us once Fox 25 had succeeded in a public records request and they knew what they had kept hidden was going to be revealed. And once we got those letters, we learned why they wanted them hidden. We learned that in May of 2023, the DA's office knew there was a federal investigation. They did not reveal that knowledge to the defense. In fact, on June 12th of 2023, the acting U.S. attorney specifically told the DA's office they could reveal the existence of this federal investigation to us, but they didn't. They kept it secret. 
And then worse, Your Honor, on December 4th of 2023, the district attorney's office provided a false notice of discovery to this court and to the defense. In that notice of discovery, they claimed they had received no confirmation that any witnesses had testified before a federal grand jury. We now know that was a lie. We know it's a lie because seven months earlier, DA Morrissey wrote that multiple state witnesses had received subpoenas. We know that was a lie because now that we've got the information from the feds, Nicole Albert testified before a federal grand jury that she participated in a group conference call with Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, Brian Albert, ADA Lally, and victim witness advocate Stephen Nelson, a group conference call before she testified before the federal grand jury in July of 2023. We also know it was a lie because he wrote in his letter, and I quote, we have confirmed that witnesses testified before the federal grand jury. Yet seven months later, the DA's office tells this court that it had received no confirmation. That is outrageous. We are outraged that he lied to us. This court should be outraged that DA Morrissey lied to you. In a prior hearing in this case, I argued to this court that the letters back and forth confirmed that DA Morrissey believed that he personally and his office in general was being targeted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, I chose my words carefully. I never said he received a target letter. The existence of a target letter is irrelevant. The inquiry is what does the DA know and believe? And he revealed in those letters what he knew and believed. He revealed that he believed that U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins had a personal animus against him. He wrote, quote, she's made no secret of her personal animosity towards me. He also wrote that the head of the public corruption unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office may be personally retaliating against him and targeting him because his wife was unhappy with the way the Norfolk DA treated her. He wrote, in short, that he knew, felt, and believed that he and his office were being targeted. Now, why is that important? It's important because of the immense power that a prosecutor has. It is important because we need an unbiased prosecutor with no vested interest in a case to try to administer justice based on the evidence and not based on any personal interest in a case. It is important because in the words of U.S. Supreme... So I'm not sure if this is... I don't know if you can see my mouse, I'm hoping. Is this Karen Reed's parents? Does anybody know that? I'm really curious because they're, um, especially the lady, her movements and kind of facial expressions at different times are kind of interesting. Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, quote, we must have assurance that those who wield this power will be guided solely by public responsibility. So I just want to tell you, you've gone over your time. I see you're reading. So you have some idea on how much longer you have. How much longer do you have with that? Probably about three minutes. Judge. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, indeed, Your Honor, Justice Jackson practically spoke to D.A. Morrissey from the grave. The prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. His discretion is tremendous. He can have citizens investigated, and if he is that kind of person, he can have this done to the tune of public statements and veiled or unveiled intimations. Or the prosecutor may choose a subtle, more subtle course and simply have citizens' friends interviewed. Prosecutor can order arrests, present cases to a grand jury in a secret session, and on the basis of his one-sided presentation of facts can cause the citizen to be indicted and held for trial. Well, while the prosecutor at his best is one of the most beneficial forces in our society, when he acts with malice or other base motives, he's one of the worst. In his own words, D.A. Morrissey revealed he has an interest in this case that goes beyond the interests of justice. He revealed that he knew that his office was being unfairly targeted and investigated. And it doesn't matter if his belief or knowledge was right or wrong. It's only important that he believes it. And this means he has a personal interest in getting Karen Reed convicted. If he can use whatever means he has at his disposal to convict her and he succeeds, that would vindicate him and harm the federal investigation of his office. On the other hand, if she's found not guilty, as we expect she will be, he knows that he and his office will remain in the crosshairs of the federal investigation. And it's important to note, Your Honor, both sides have been made aware multiple times that as 
Uh, we have this hearing today. That federal investigation is still open. They've called most of the Commonwealth's witnesses to testify, but they're, they're not done. DA Morrissey has an interest in this case not to do justice, but to win. That's why he hid his knowledge of the federal investigation for seven months. That's why he slow walked discovery. That's why he gave a lengthy video statement saying Karen Reed is guilty. That's why he talked about our theory being a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. And perhaps that's why in contravention of Judge Krupp's uh, preservation order, DA Morrissey's office gave the go ahead to Brian Albert and Brian Higgins to destroy or dispose of their phones. We only learned that because the federal authorities revealed that in their investigation. And I'm just about ready to end. The DA also, as my colleague has uh, indicated, I'm sorry, the, the FBI has confirmed that Jennifer McCabe Googled, uh, you know, how long to die in the cold at 2.27 in the morning. Um, but what has not yet been mentioned is that five minutes before that, Brian Higgins and Brian Albert were calling each other at 2.22 in the morning on January 29th after previously testifying. They were both asleep at that time. There was a lot of suspicious activity in the early morning hours of January involving the witnesses that Morrissey improperly announced to the public were telling the truth. We're getting to the bottom of it and the truth will come out. But as we continue to defend her, Your Honor, like any criminal defendant, my client deserves a neutral, impartial prosecutor interested solely in justice with no vested outcome in this case. And it's crystal clear we do not have that in Michael Morrissey. That is why he should be disqualified from this case. And that is why I urge you to do just that in the interest of impartial justice. All right. Thank you very much. Who's arguing this? You, Mr. Lally? Yeah. All right. So let's start with 10 if you need more. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and again, I, I don't think I'm going to need uh, much more than that. Um, again, I, I know the court has reviewed all the materials, and I know the court is well aware of the standard, and it's a standard uh, which I would submit uh, just simply hasn't been met here. Uh, to characterize um, counsel's actions uh, in this particular proceeding uh, with uh, specific reference to the media and saying it's it's different, I, I think is is minimization to the highest degree. Um, essentially, what the defendant is is positing or what counsel is positing in this uh, motion is that due to a, a recorded statement by the district attorney uh, over six months ago, uh, that that impinges uh, on her right to a fair trial or it impinges, uh, you know, show some sort of deleterious motive on behalf of the district attorney in the handling of this case. The statement, as uh, the district attorney indicated in it, uh, was in response to an extraordinary degree of relentless uh, and, and really relentless harassment and intimidation of nearly every witness uh, associated with this case which included a July 22nd rolling rally of nearly 100 people traveling to witnesses' homes and calling them murderers. That is, is largely what uh, this was in response to and is in complete conformity with Massachusetts Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6b6 that permits an attorney to make a warning of danger concerning the behavior of a person involved when there is reason to believe that there exists a likelihood of substantial harm to an individual or to the public interest. It's also in conformity with Rule of Professional Conduct 3.6c, uh, which allows for such statements to rebut the prejudicial effects of the defendant's and her counsel's misconduct. Uh, now, again, I know the court has, has read through uh, the Commonwealth's opposition, uh, but just to uh, highlight a few of those particular incidents. So, yes, um, the July 31st, I believe, was the ruling uh, in regard to the, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a gag order. Um, and I, I think it's been somewhat inappropriately or, or just patently falsely represented uh, uh, to this court and in, in, in public what that what that ruling said. It indicated um, <clears throat> that the statements uh, of counsel arguably crossed cross the line of uh, permissibility under Rule 3.6, and that meaning defense counsel. Uh, that the inflammatory statements uh, about the Commonwealth and witnesses, particularly by Attorney Jackson, appear to have fueled much of the publicity in this case. And that's a quote from the court's ruling. 
and that the defense counsel did not have carte blanche to speak with the media and going forward, defense counsel should ensure that their statements are limited in conformity with the rules. And it denied uh, the Commonwealth's request for that gag order at this time, um, denying it without prejudice. And then Mr. Giannetti wants to get up here and say that they largely stopped making extrajudicial statements after the court's ruling. And so I guess largely stopping would then include August 22nd, the day before the district attorney's uh, statement, a uh, ABC News broadcast in which Mr. Yanetti and Mr. Jackson uh, were, were featured uh, for a nine minute, 37 second segment in which attorney Jackson uh, indicated that pieces of taillight were planted after the fact that the victim walked into the house. I think he was confronted, was likely brought down to the basement. I think the confrontation got physical and he was beaten, beaten to a point of unconsciousness, uh, that he had defensive wounds, uh, bruises on the back of his hands, largely of which uh, is all not only not true, uh, but directly contradictory to the uh, vast amount of evidence uh, that has been turned over in this case. Mr. Jackson then went on to continue that this was a cover-up and indicating that John was murdered inside that house, his body was placed outside. <clears throat> this also continued into September. Uh, September 17th, the defendant traveling with Attorney Jackson, Attorney Little, and a woman believed to be a television news producer to the victim's home, to Mr. O'Keefe's home, in direct violation of her conditions of release where she has a stay away from, uh, as well as other places of interest and sort of tour uh, around the town of Canton. When balancing the amount of public and prejudicial statements made by the defendant and her counsel, the Commonwealth would suggest that then characterizing the district attorney's statement from over six months ago, threatening her right to a fair trial, is simply a position that's just untenable. Now, in context, as far as those particular statements, uh, those particular actions go, um, as the court is well aware, um, there is a significant history uh, between this defendant, Mr. Unetti, Mr. Jackson, and the social media blogger, Mr. Kearney, who's now been indicted for intimidation of witnesses in this case. Um, and with reference uh, to that, there is a significant, despite public uh, indications to the contrary, uh, that indications from Mr. Kearney's phone, uh, which was seized, is that there is a precipitous amount of phone communications, indications of uh, communications between Mr. Kearney and Ms. Reed on a signal messaging app, uh, an encrypted app, as well as I believe about 189 phone calls over a span of a few months. And that's just what's indicated or contained in the phone. There is also, going back to the spring of 23, direct communications between Mr. Kearney and Mr. Yanetti and Mr. Kearney and Mr. Jackson. They went out to lunch with Mr. Kearney following a court date in May of 2023. And this is a person who counsel in the memo uh, seems to want to distance themselves from uh, based, I'm presuming, on subsequent indictments. But the truth is in, in the phone. The phone doesn't lie as far as those communications are concerned, as far as those communications uh, between counsel and between the defendant uh, in this particular case. So, of course, they're talking about Turtle Boy, right? It's Turtle Boy that they um, have been going after for all different types of things. Now, I'm not in a position to agree or disagree. I'm just learning, like everybody else, what the hell is going on with this case. Okay, so to say uh, that this is a different case, uh, again, I would suggest is a large uh, minimization of, of what actually has transpired here. Lastly, what I'll say in reference to the federal grand jury, uh, what is also clear from the uh, federal grand jury is that this was an investigation which was initiated by the defendant and Mr. Yanetti. So to claim that he was in the dark or didn't know about this federal investigation, every bit of discovery that the federal government has from the state case was provided by Mr. Yanetti. Nothing was asked for from the Commonwealth. Nothing was asked for from the district attorney's office, the state police. So again, what I was intimating before in reference to the motion to dismiss, I have no idea what they have seen or what they haven't seen, how much of the file, how much of the discovery or anything else. It's all sort of been provided and colored uh, by Mr. Yanetti. And this goes back to November of 2022. So to then claim that you were sandbagged or didn't know about an investigation that you initiated over a year before 
until late in this, uh, December of 2023 is, I think, disingenuous. Uh, is disingenuous would be about the nicest term that I can come up with for that. Thank you. All right, Mr. Yanetti, a short um, rebuttal, I guess, or a short comment. I would just add, Your Honor, that um, the focus of Mr. Lally's argument was on everything except for Mr. Morrissey's conduct. Just like it doesn't matter if Mr. Morrissey and his office are actually targets of an investigation, it's only what he knew and believed. Similarly, with regard to his conduct in keeping secret the existence of a federal uh, investigation, it doesn't matter whether we knew about it or not. It's the fact that Morrissey knew kept it secret for seven months and didn't reveal it to the defense until the media got access to those letters. And with that, I would rest. Okay, thank you. So I do have a question. Did you file the Rule 17 motions already or do you expect to file them later today? We will be filing them by the close of business today. Okay, and they're pretty much outlined in your previous motion what you needed to file or are there additional ones? In your motion, I they're continue. outlined. Yeah, they're outlined, Judge. Okay, I asked because uh, Mr. Roach told me that on the March 20th date, um, the council wants it to be via Zoom. Um, I'd prefer it not be because with Rule 17, as you know, the, the record holders come into court and object. So I don't want you all to be on the screen. And Mr. Yanetti, certainly your local council, Mr. Jackson, if you want to be on the screen, you can. But I, I need somebody here. I understood you wrong. That's fine. Okay. That's it, fine. It makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I, if I may just say. Yes. Um, can I appear in person and have my client join no, me? No, she has to be here. Okay. Thank you, Judge. All right. Um, was there something else? Uh, do, yes. I, I would ask, may we approach just as the scheduling issues? Okay. Mm -hmm. That is what I wanted you guys to see. There um, should be some results coming up. We should have an answer coming up fairly shortly. As soon as we get hearing dates and what have you, we will do this again. So I hope that information helped you out. I'm expecting more stuff from the feds, just like they said. So make sure you subscribe, like, share and make sure you hit that bell because we do know that the think tank does do streams very randomly when the news breaks i'm back so guys i appreciate every single one of you thank you so much for being here with me and i will see you in the next one bye